Welcome to a very long time requested video subject from you guys. Uh, today we are speaking about Tyr and as always going over the translations, attestations and true meanings behind the Norse gods. So guys check out my playlist on these things. You guys ask all the time about gods and I've already done full in-depth videos on them before um, and what they mean and what they're symbolic of. As always, we have to say, does this make us atheists when our gods and our religion are symbolic? No, it makes us animist. Same as every single other culture's beliefs in the world if we go far back in time. So, most of the Norse gods are actually very easy to determine uh, exactly what it is they represent, whether that be a part of nature or spirit or our own bodies. Anything like that, um, we can do this by simply translating the gods' names and see how they fit into our mythology. Uh, Tyr is not one of those easy ones, okay? Tyr is probably the most difficult one to determine because the sources we have are so vague and conflicting and the actual meaning and etymology of Tyr's name um, can send us on a contradictory path which we will go over in this video so we may never know what Tyr was uh, but as always I make these videos so we can all put our minds together and discover the lost beliefs of our people so I can give you guys the sources um, and they'll always be in the links below and I can go over the previously brought forward theories by the scholarly communities but I would like to hear from all of you guys too, if you have any ideas of ways we can fit it all together. So write down below in the comments um, as we go, but for now on to Tyr. As usual, we go over the translation and etymology first. So Tyr comes from Proto-Norse Tivad, uh, which uh, has parallels in other Germanic languages, all you can see here. Um, and all these names come from the Proto-Germanic Tivas. And all of these names have essentially the same meaning. It was a god. Uh, this is what uh, what uh, Tyr meant in all of these languages here. Uh, this goes back to about 2,000 years ago, uh, and possibly even before then, uh, to the Proto-Germanic language. But it gets a whole lot more, in uh, more interesting than that if we go further back in time. All these derive from the Proto-Indo-European word devos, which means something like celestial or heavenly one, basically a god, um, which is also related to the Indo-European dios or dios pater. Um, I'm probably not saying that right, but it's father of daylight or sky god or sky all father. Something like that is what it originally meant. So some ancient all father of the sky that all of us Indo-Europeans uh, 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 worshipped and viewed as as a, as as a primary god when we were one religion, one people, one language. Going back, you know, this is seven, eight thousand years ago. Now we find words that stem from this original sky father, uh, Dios Patr, in basically every other Indo-European language, all of them that you see here, Sanskrit, uh, Latin, uh, um, uh, Zeus, um, even uh, uh, yeah, Jupiter, Jove in the Roman mythology. So each and every one of these are Indo-European sky gods from thousands and thousands of years later on in time, and they are all related to Tyr. And if we go back far enough, they were all one and the same. They would have been this Dios Pate, this uh, All-Father all Sky God. Um, it's, this, this is actually one of the few things about Tyr that is pretty uh, irrefutable, and it's agreed upon by linguists and scholars of religion alike. There are a bunch of videos on YouTube and there are articles online about who this original Indo-European sky god was. I'll link a few um, uh, down below. Um, so this is what Tyr once was as well. At least if we go back to, we can say, maybe more than three, four thousand years ago. But this is where it gets difficult. We don't have attestations of Tyr in the Germanic world until about two thousand years ago. And this is what sends us on a wild goose chase. So here are some of the sources on those. The earliest ones uh, are the uh, Latin inscriptions coming from ancient Rome. Um, they refer to uh, 
Tyr as the Roman god uh, Mars. So this is a process known as Interpretatio uh, Romana or Germania. Uh, so it's basically the Romans who were writing about foreign gods and they equated them to their own Roman gods and called them that in the text. So it's not that the Germanic tribes were calling that god Mars. No, they would have been calling him Tivas. It's just the Romans wrote it down at Mar as Mars because they viewed those two to be the same god. You all will be most familiar with this um, from the practice of uh, naming our weekdays. Uh, the Roman weekday of Tuesday, Dies Martis, which is uh, Mars's day. That was adapted into our Germanic language as Tuesday or Tierstag or all these different forms of the word Tuesday. So it's basically Tuesday. So that's just one way that we know how ancient peoples saw their gods as parallels in different cultures. The first example of this comes in Tacitus Germania, where he says how the Germanic peoples gave sacrifices to Hercules and Mars, a.k.a. Uh, Tyr and Thunras and Tivas, or so Tyr and Thor, they would have been called back then. Later on in this same text, Germania, Tacitus mentioned a deity referred to as Regenator Omenum Deus, uh, venerated by the tribe the Semones in a grove of fetters, which was a sacred grove. As some scholars propose that the 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 uh, ruler of all this omnum deus uh, is in fact tyr of course we know this is re linguistically related to deus but also because they uh, the fetters that are mentioned in this sacred grove just like tyr was the one who fettered the wolf fenrir so that's a theory um, that they have there uh, we also have some archaeological finds referring to Mars from around this time, and this is long before the Viking Age, there was a void of altar in the 3rd century that was written in the Latin language, but it was uh, written by Germanic Frisian mercenaries hired by Rome who were in Britain right by Hadrian's Wall, and they refer to Mars on this void of altar as um, uh, Mars Thingsus, so basically meaning th Tyr of the thing. So the thing was a big meeting in Germanic cultures, like a legal assembly. They made laws and settled disputes and things like that. So by calling Tyr the Mars of the assembly, it's saying like he was kind of a big deal in these meetings, these legal meetings. And this is where the idea originates that Tyr was the god of uh, justice and law. Uh, but there is more evidence that comes on that a bit later on in time. We also have a couple hundred years later, the Germanic peoples, uh, the, uh, the Goths in the east of Europe, they venerated Tyr as well. In the 6th century, Roman historian Jordanus writes in his uh, work that the Goths saw their god Mars as an ancestral figure and also how he was a god of war and he was worshipped to and given sacrifices to, as you can see in this text. So you guys can start to see the problem here. Uh, going back to Indo-European times, you know, like I said, seven, eight thousand years ago, um, but possibly as recent as maybe three thousand years ago, we don't know. But uh, uh, for the longest time, uh, at its very origins, Tyr or Tivas or Deus was a sky god, well, they, it was a sky all-father god. Then we're talking about two thousand years ago to maybe fifteen hundred years ago. Tyr doesn't ha seem to have anything to do whatsoever with the sky and the sources that we have. The attestations clearly mention him as a god of war primarily, but also having uh, some relation to justice or legal assembly. On top of that, uh, the Romans uh, equate Tyr with their god Mars, the Roman god Mars, and that's the god of war and the agricultural guardian, that kind of thing. Now, the Roman god Jupiter, or Jove, is a Roman sky god that is etymologically related to Tyr. And if we go back, they were both descended from this sky all-father, uh, Deus. But the Romans made no connection between Tyr and Jupiter at all in those sources. So very clearly, Tyr was not a sky god anymore, according to any of the sources. He was a war god that the Romans equated with uh, Mars. 
So at some point from about 7,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago, this heavenly sky father god turned into a war god among the Germanic peoples. We don't know exactly when or why this happened, but that's what happened. These things um, are when we need to ask ourselves um, if we want to truly understand what Tiud was. Did humans originally worship this all-powerful sky god at, and at some point they started to worship him because they thought it would bring them success in battle? Or did they somehow maybe try and invoke the energy of this sky god to make them more powerful for battle? At some point that may have happened. Uh, also, a question, um, when did the connection to justice come in? Did ancient humans at one point decide to invoke this sky god uh, to have some sort of function in legal cases? Okay, it, it sounds pretty logical, although we don't have any sources giving a good explanation for that. It sounds logical. An all-father god in the sky that you can maybe invoke for um, success in battle and, um, uh, yeah, and in legal assemblies. But then... Let's fast forward to the Viking Age. Uh, then we get another pile of shit smeared all over the puzzle we are trying to figure out. In the Viking Age, even though Tyr was a prime god and possibly the most important uh, all-father god in previous uh, millennia, um, in the Viking Age, though, he does not seem very important at all. And there is nothing connecting him to the sky, and, and, and there's very little connecting him to war or justice or any of that either. He seems, Tyr seems to have a relatively um, irrelevant function in society. And in the sources about the Viking Age, we have a grand total of zero sources of Tyr being worshipped or invoked or sacrificed to, even though we have dozens of records uh, of sacrifices to Odin, Thor, Freyr, and we have very little mentions of Tyr also in the mythology that are of any significance as well. I'm going to go over the myths um, in a minute because that's the final piece of the puzzle we're going to try to figure out, but at first... Even though we don't have much clear evidence that Tyr was an important god in the Viking Age, we do have a couple little clues. First of all, we have the place names. Place names are often uh, thought to reflect the importance of a god in that society. And there are 31 place names in Denmark that are named after Tyr. In Norway, there's not many. There's just a handful, I think three or four. And in Sweden, I'm not aware of any at all that are named after Tyr. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. I don't know. I'm not a big believer that place name evidence can tell us much at all, but a lot of the scholars put a lot of weight on that. Um, that's fine. We can disagree on that, but that's up to you guys. Do with that data uh, what you want. Another thing, though, that far better reflects the importance of Tyr is the runes. Tyr is the only god that has a rune named after him, and I think that is definitely significant. The runes and the ancient symbolism there, um, okay, so we can see it's obviously shaped as an arrow or a spear, or something like that. Going back to the origins of the runes, you know, humans chose to name this room after Tyr, you know, is there some connection to an arrow in Tyr or, an, you know, like one of these oldest rituals of shooting an arrow up at the sky to make it rain like many cultures have done in the most ancient times? I'm not going to theorize too much about that because a lot of people get butthurt about the runes and, you know, these original meanings and maybe do some other videos. But, um, yeah, it's, it's nothing confirmed either way. But I will talk about the rune poems. There are three rune poems in three different languages. The Norwegian and the Icelandic, they are pretty clear, and they refer to Tyr just like we know him uh, from the myths of losing his hand, a one-handed one god. But the oldest of the three rune poems is actually the Anglo-Saxon rune poem, and that one is a bit more interesting. There you can see some connection to the sky, actually, even though the Anglo-Saxons... Uh, were Christian by this time. They were the first to Christianize in, uh, of, of, of all the Scandinavian countries. They Christianized in England much earlier. But that um, a, a rune poem shows kind of more traces to original oldest pagan belief. So you can see that maybe some ancient sky god that Tyr was uh, reflected there. 
Okay, so let's get on to the main uh, sources on Tyr now. The Norse myths from the Viking Age in the Poetic Era and the Prose Era. Before we start, it's worth noting that Tyr is one of the only main gods that is not uh, euhemerized in other sources, okay? So what that means is when Christian authors of the time wrote their works, they sometimes wrote uh, their history books to make the gods out to be real humans that lived in the texts. So like they, they wrote the gods were uh, ancestors that lived hundreds of years before. Uh, Thor, for example, is euhemerized in the prose Edda. Odin, Freyr, Freya, they're euhemerized in Ynglinga Saga. Balder and Hoder are euhemerized in Gesta the Norum. There's a lot more uh, sources, not just in the north of Europe, but all over the Europe, making the gods as real humans. So, like I said, this is a Christian uh, tactic that they used writing about the history to make their gods seem less divine. Um, but most of the gods are attested as real humans, uh, kings, uh, from a few sources at least, while Tyr is not mentioned as a human anywhere at all. If I don't know how valuable that information is, but there you go, I'm uh, leaving no stone unturned here. Uh, so starting off with the Poetic Edda. So the Poetic Edda, which is the older and far more reliable uh, source to original pagan uh, poetry and belief, and Tyr is actually not mentioned in much detail there at all. The main one is Himskvida. Tyr tells everyone that his father, Himir, has a huge cauldron big enough to brew loads of uh, uh, ale for the gods. Uh, Thor says, okay, cool, let's go get it. So Thor and Tyr go on this adventure to Himir's place. When they get there, Tyr uh, runs into his uh, grandmother who has 900 heads. And for some reason, uh, she really doesn't like him. <laughs> but there's also this other girl covered, uh, who is said to be covered in gold, that helps Tyr and Thor sneak around and hide from Hymir when he comes home. Hymir comes back from hunting, and then his wife, um, who isn't named, um, tells him, uh, your son Tyr is here, and he's brought Thor with him. They're hiding behind a pillar, but Hymir um, basically used his sharp eye, and he looks over and decimated, smashes the pillar into dust and all these kettles around it but the kettle where Tyr and Thor were hiding was super strong so it didn't break and the two gods just um, yeah, yeah they, they go on with the rest of the story um, this is the story when um, Thor and uh, Hymir go fishing they, they have a feast first and they go fishing the next day and Thor gets into his little struggle with Jörmungandr and Tyr doesn't come with uh, him at all so that's, uh, that stops talking about Tyr to kind of halfway through and focuses on Thor for the rest. Um, what does that all mean? I'll cover that in the next video, but on to a uh, more uh, detailed source, um, Sigurdrifamo. The Valkyrie Sig Sigurdrifa um, gives Sigurd uh, knowledge of various runic charms, and one of them invokes the god Tyr, like you can see here. So this is really the only source from the Viking Age where we can link Tyr to victory or war. Uh, but remember, in the Germanic Tribal Age, uh, 500 to 1,000 years before, he was attested as a war god multiple times. Uh, another poem, Lukasenna, is when this feast is going on, with all the gods drinking at Agir's place. Then, out of nowhere, Loki crashes the party and he starts this um, uh, insult battle, like the rap battle uh, called Flitting that the Vikings used to do. Now Tyr is there too at this feast and Loki is going around, he's talking shit to everyone like he does, um, but he gets to the god Freyr, Tyr steps up to defend Freyr, but Loki uh, comes with a comeback and he's like, how can you talk about justice Tyr when you don't even have a right hand, okay? Uh, but Tyr, um, you know, comes back saying, sure, I lost my hand, but you lost your son Fenrir, who is now tied up and, until Jagnarok. Um, and that's about it. Um, uh, but this loss of, um, that that's all the mentions of Tyr we have in the Poetic Edda, but in the Prose Edda, that myth is covered in a lot more detail. So going on to the Prose Edda, uh, where Tyr is mentioned uh, more and in a lot more detail, just remember that the Prose Edda was written by Snorri, a Christian, 
about 2,000 years, uh, sorry, 200 years after the Viking Age, and many parts of the prose Edda uh, do not align themselves with the much older poetic Edda poems. Uh, Snoddy even contradicts himself sometimes in the prose Edda as well, so it's not to be taken with as much weight as the poetic Edda, but it is a valuable source uh, regardless. So in the prose Edda section, uh, Gilfagning and the Skaldskapmål, they reference Tyr several times. Uh, the god is introduced um, in this section. Um, so here too, uh, that that's the only other example where we see uh, Tyr as a god involved in war and victory. And it also touches on this tale of Tyr binding Fenrir and getting his hand bit off. Gilfagenen goes into a little more detail in uh, section 34, and it says that the Asir brought up the wolf at home, and it was only Tyr who had the courage to approach the wolf and give it food. So Tyr was um, giving food to uh, Fenrir, the wolf, before they chained him up. Later on in Gilfagenen, um, High discusses Tyr's unforeseen death during the uh, events of Ragnarok, how Tyr and the hound Garim are going to be the ones that end up killing each other at, at the Ragnarok. Final part of the prose era in Skaldskapamo. This is very, very important, and, and I think this is, uh, this is one of the most important things we've got to remember. Um, the Skald um, uh, tells uh, Agir uh, how kennings can function, and by kennings, they're basically like poetical metaphors in Old Norse language, and um, sometimes uh, Odin could be referred to as victory tier, or the hanged tier, or cargo tier. And also in Skaldskapamal, Thor can be referred to as chariot tier. So other gods can be referred to as tier as well. Very interesting. Remember, um, at that time, tier, even though he was a god, he kind of was uh, the, the actual definition of his name meant kind of this broad meaning of god. Uh, so. Final sources, then we will get on to the uh, interpretations uh, towards the end. The archaeological finds, we should go over this. They can teach us a bit more about the function of Tyr. I spoke about the void of altar and um, mentioning uh, Tyr, of, uh, Tyr of the thing, uh, like uh, the legal assembly that he has a connection to. We also have a couple runic inscriptions mentioning Tyr. Um, there are a lot of them that kind of have these Tyr bind runes carved on it multiple times. Um, there are a lot of archaeological finds with that, but the most famous ones are here. Uh, the Lindholm amulet, dated um, to the from the 2nd or 3rd century, contains three se consecutive T runes, um, but other than that the amulet is plain gibberish, so we think it was for some sort of magical use. Same thing with the Kilver stone. Here there is eight stacked Tivas runes um, at the end of another inscription that seems to be gibberish, so we think that is some sort of magic inscription again. Another, though, um, from about 500 uh, AD, the Scandinavian Brechtedet um, that you see here um, is an Elder Futhark inscription ending with three stacked Tivas runes, and this is about the only one that has plain understandable English. It's a bit cryptic, but this word in the front uh, runologists think that is is a derivation of Hadia, so um, that means army or troop. So this was maybe believed to bring good luck in battle and then invoking Tyr, of course, uh, by wearing this amulet, possibly. That's about it. Uh, we do have another Bracteat here showing Tyr uh, with his hand in the wolf's mouth, so even more proof that that myth uh, was real and probably the most significant and well-known one about Tyr. So we really have to figure out what this myth means, what this myth was about Tyr binding Fenrir and then getting his hand bit off. Uh, so the most common one is the, the one you may all uh, be familiar with, and that is Tyr, who functions as a god of uh, war and over the realm of justice and law. This theory was first started by George Dumzel uh, a while back, and we basically um, uh, th theorized that due to the fact that some of the names uh, mentioning Tyr, he is connected to a thing, so the legal assembly. Also, how Tyr, like many other gods, in Indo-European mythologies, they also have a function involving justice and law, 
they also lost their hand just as Tyr did. Most well-known uh, parallel to that is in Celtic mythology, um, the god uh, Nuada. Now, before we dive into what all that means, um, it's important to know that a lot of scholars have suggested that Odin took over a lot of Tyr's roles by the Viking Age, and Odin replaced Tyr in a lot of the myths. Like we touched on earlier, um, there are, uh, you know, remember in most ancient times, we're talking anywhere from five to 8,000 years ago, Tyr or Deus was this prime top sky all father god. About 2,000 years ago, Tyr was still important, equally as important as Odin, it seems, uh, from the uh, mentions in the Roman sources there. And, and remember, he, they, they, two gods that the Germanic tribes uh, really revered around 98 AD. Um, so that might hint that at that time that Odin and Tyr were equally important. But by the Viking Age, a thousand years ago or so, Odin kind of overshadowed Tyr. And he is believed to take over a lot of his functions in the myths. And we see Odin functioning primarily in the myths. I'm not primarily, we will say that, but a lot of what Odin can function as in the myths is a war god. For example, he was called upon to bring victory, like as told in Inglinga Saga. He was sacrificed to in order to bring victory in war. Odin was also the lord of the berserkers, um, so, so a lot more connections we have uh, with Odin and war than Tyr, but just be aware that as little attestations we have as of Tyr in the Viking Age, many of the myths about Odin could have originally actually been Tyr in that place, in Odin's place. This is what scholars have theorized, but we can't know for sure. We just remember many of the myths about Odin may very well have been uh, Tyr originally, so Tyr would have had a lot more importance um, uh, going back to before the Viking Age, especially involving the myths um, uh, in war. Those could have been Tyr in his place. So why replace Odin? Why did Odin uh, take over the functions of Tyr and for what reason? I don't know. Some have suggested that Tyr was uh, originally the sky god, uh, like we are pretty sure of. So people would invoke the power of the sky to win their battles, uh, making this sky god a god of war too. But at some point, people thought that that maybe wasn't so reliable anymore to invoke the sky god for war. Maybe they tried it over thousands of years and they figured out not so reliable and they found out that other deities and energies they could invoke for more success in uh, war. Odin, for example, which is very clearly the god of frenzy, rage, ecstasy, and that what previously in time was probably used more for just spiritual and shamanic type rituals. Um, but eventually humans maybe figured out that they could use this frenzied ecstatic energy uh, that is Odin to bring them success in, more, in War 2. And that, was, um, that, that gave them better results than invoking the sky god that is Tyr. So that, that could have been what happened there. But Tyr definitely didn't completely disappear as a war god. We have a couple sources as late as the Viking Age that still tie him to victory and war, like I mentioned. It's just Odin was a lot more attached to war. So maybe most tribes during the uh, uh, Viking Age invoked Odin for war, for help in war. But certain tribes, um, whether they did it in prayer or sacrifice, if we didn't hear of, or if they just carved tiered runes on their amulets or swords some tribes may have done that as well so just a thought that being said uh, finishing off the video let's try to uncover these two myths because they really are the only two two that mentioned to you in detail and that is Himskvida and you know the story of Fenrir biting off the hand of Tyr. Maria Kvilhaug has a great interpretation of these myths. Um, she is actually the only one that I'm aware of, that I've read, who actually tries to explain them in detail. So she relates Fenrir to greed. Um, Fenrir is the wolf of greed. Fenrir is the personification of greed and gluttony in ourselves, in our society, and in the universe and cosmos as a whole. This greed is what is going to eventually devour Odin 
and everything else around us. It devours everything, uh, but most specifically, Fenrir uh, devours Odin at Ragnarök. Um, so Odin is our frenzy, our ecstasy spirit. Um, and so when that is devoured, uh, symbolically relating it to it, our greed, making it so that we are no longer able to reach these altered spiritual states to get whatever spiritual uh, benefits we are trying to get out of it. The gods try to uh, keep Fenrir, but the greed of Fenrir seems to be so powerful and too strong and it grows too big and bigger and bigger and bigger. So then we had to figure out a way to bind our own greed so it doesn't devour everything else around us. We had to keep it in check so we don't kill ourselves and devour everything around us. And what the gods did was first they tried to contain uh, Fenrir with a chain. Uh, they tried to bind Fenrir with a chain that was called Lething or Lething. Directly translated, it was it means something like harm thing, like the old Norse thing, like legal assembly again. So that doesn't work. So this is symbolic of humans trying to use politics and legal assemblies to contain this greed that is Fenrir. That does not work, no matter what laws we set up, <laughs> we're still greedy, and Fenrir breaks through that chain. The next chain we try to bind Fenrir with is called Dromi, which directly translated just means fetters or chain, however. Chains and fetters, as um, Maria Kvilhaug um, uh, brings up, is that it's a metaphor in some sources um, uh, that a skald Einar Skallagrim referred to the gods as. So the gods can be referred to as fetters or chains. So what happened then, that, that's symbolic of humans, you know, praying to the gods or trying to invoke the help of the gods in order to keep their own greed and the greed of society at bay. Again, this didn't work because Fenrir broke through that chain as well. Finally, the gods got the dwarves to make the chain called Gleipnir, which means the open one in Old Norse. And essentially, it's this chain is made out of things that don't exist. The sound of a, calf, a cat's footfall or the beard of a woman, breath of the fish and all these things you see here. Um, this is the chain that was able to bind Fenrir, but only after... Uh, Tyr agreed to put his hand in Fenrir's mouth as collateral, um, uh, just in case Fenrir couldn't break it off. So then, of course, you all know the rest of the story. Fenrir bites Tyr's hand off, and that is it. So Maria relates uh, Tyr to the warriors uh, of a society, or even the collective war spirit, um, uh, the, the ones uh, who sacrifice themselves to defend their people. This is the only thing that can actually keep greed at bay. However you guys want to interpret that, um, uh, you, whatever warrior class, they use their power, they use their honor, their bravery to keep this greed in society at bay. At least until Ragnarök, when Fenrir is able to break free and then devour, start devouring everything again. Uh, to but, but he is stopped. He devours Odin, um, but he is stopped by Vidar. Actually, uh, I'm just I'm just paraphrasing that theory there. But you guys will get a much better uh, description in Maria Kvilhaug's uh, book. So you definitely should pick that up. That's my favorite one uh, with interpretations on the Norse myths. I agree with that theory. With a couple little things that I would add to it, of course Vidar is the one who eventually kills Fenrir and stops Fenrir from devouring the whole cosmos. Vidar, uh, uh, son of Odin, is pretty clearly some sort of land spirit or forest spirit. Uh, specifically Vidar has been interpreted by scholars before as the personification as open, empty, unused space. Um, so plenty of space, that, that's super key. Plenty of space is the only thing that can finally destroy greed. So when we have plenty of space in nature, plenty of food, plenty of room to grow, we don't have to fight over these crowded parts of land and fight over resources. So there is no need to be greedy in that case. That's where Vidar comes into play and how he is eventually able to uh, destroy the wolf of greed, Fenrir. After Ragnarök, Tyr is gone. He is killed uh, by the uh, hound Garim. 
So Tyr is dead after Ragnarok. The war spirit in the society is dead. But greed Fenrir is also gone. A lot of things are also gone after Ragnarok. A lot of things die and disappear. But it also leads to a beautiful time, a rebirth, where the world is allowed to rebuild and not be at each other's throats all the time, greedy for resources. So that, that those are just my thoughts, by the way, uh, that I had in addition to that. Um, but let me know if you guys have any more thoughts, um, uh, things to fill in the blanks there. Finally, we can speak about Himskrida, when Thod and Tyr uh, go to Tyr's father, Himir, uh, to get a cauldron for the gods so they can drink uh, the mead at Agir's uh, feast. And then Thor goes on a fishing trip and catches uh, Jörmungandr. Uh, so I've done videos on that before. Thor is the life force in us and all living things. He's also, Thor represents like the surrounding barrier that protects us from outside harm as people have theorized. The earth, uh, that is the electromagnetic field that thought can be a representative of. Um, but on humans, we also have a protective field around us that is related to our life force. Think of Thor as a personification of the aura uh, from Eastern belief. Now, Yorimangandr is very clearly the barrier between our world and the next, so that Thor is always fighting to break through, fighting to conquer, but he can never achieve victory because our life force cannot transcend realms like that. Other aspects of our soul can, like uh, Odr or our Hugir, for example, they can transcend these realms, but our life force cannot be brought with us into other realms like that. Uh, so this myth is another tale about Thor on his journey protecting the Jotnar, uh, uh, from the uh, of the outer world, um, protecting the world from that. Himir is the giant in this uh, story, and another one of Thor's struggles with Jormungandr that almost ends in a defeat, but not quite. We know this is an accurate old pagan myth because not just in the written sources, but also on some archaeological finds like you see here, this is depicted. But where does Tyr fit into all this story? Like I mentioned before, he, he doesn't come with on the fishing trip, he is only part of the first half of Thor's journey. I don't know, I don't really have any thoughts about that, let me know what you guys think, I haven't read any compelling theories anywhere, but one thing I think is interesting, when Thor and Tyr are in the home uh, waiting for Hymir to return, his wife hides Thor and Tyr under a kettle, and when Hymir got home he was startled to learn that they were there and he gave a glare that broke all the pillars and the kettles in the house, but the one that Thor and Tyr were hidden under, they protected them. So this could be a reference to when we are dead. It's, it's in the afterlife, or if we're in some other realm, Thor, our life force is there, and also Tyr, our war spirit, still remains with us in the afterlife, waiting to be reborn in the next body. The other parts of our, our body, of course, doesn't uh, remain with us, um, and other parts of our soul do not remain with us. Um, they are, are the Hugin and Munin, our thoughts and memory, Odin's two ravens. Um, they start to leave us as well, but what is still there waiting to be reborn is our life force, and our uh, war spirits, our warrior spirits. Uh, but th that's why I think Thor and Tyr are traveling together on this trip. It's a, it's a trip uh, speaking about the afterlife and waiting to be reborn, as is a lot of other uh, myths involving Thor. Uh, Thrymskrida is another one. It's another thing about our life force in, in the realm of the dead waiting to be reborn. Um, so that's, that's what a lot of the myths about Thor are as well. To conclude, um, that's just my theory by the way, but to conclude, um, the, uh, the Tyr is the war spirits, or um, specifically the collective war bands that protect the society possibly, even though that in most of the Viking Age sources, Odin actually functions as this war spirit. And we also have Hermoder, whose name is related to Odin and actually directly translates to the uh, spiritual frenzy war spirit of the warriors. But remember, it's very likely that Odin took on a lot of the functions of Tyr by the time the Viking Age came around. So very likely that it was Tyr that was originally this war spirit that Odin or even Hadimoder represents in a lot of the myths. Uh, Tyr was possibly the, uh, the original 
one that should have been in those myths. But I think it's a very specific type of war spirit that Tyr uh, uh, represents, and that is uh, bravery and honor. It's Tyr is bravery and honor personified. This explains why he was also a god involved with the things, the legal assemblies, because honor would have also had to be invoked there to make sure testifying and, and making laws and judgments were, were kept honorable. How does this all um, relate to the oldest forms of Tyr's name as a sky father? The only thing I can think of is that ancient, ancient humans believed that there was some sort of honor and war spirits energy that they could look up to the sky and invoke and draw this energy into themselves. That's the only thing that I can think of that relates uh, all, these, all these theories together. But who knows? Just theories. That's the best I've got. Let me know what you guys think. That's why I make these videos uh, so I can just bring you the sources. But at the end of the day, you have to form your own beliefs. Um, so let us know what you think about in the comments. We can put our heads together and discover the lost beliefs of our people. But that's all I have to say for today. We say as next to go.